Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, January 27th. We are in our study of what happens on God's timeline from the end of the tribulation all the way out to eternity future. The point that we've come to is the judgments which are telling us who gets to go into the millennial kingdom. Uh, last week when we talked also about this, the question was raised, what size will Israel be when she has all of her land? I was unable to get a map that will work well with a Zoom setting. Um, I didn't start early enough to find the solution, so forgive me. I'll show you a map again. Well, not again, but hopefully in a week uh, when we meet again. Uh, but it is part of Iraq, part of Iran, Syria, the, the land that is Israel, Jordan, part down into um, Egypt, uh, the edge of it, uh, is quite, you know, extensive through that area. Um, but I'll, I'll do you one better, hopefully, with a visual aid that we can do in the camera, you know, for the camera, rather than what we would do in a classroom setting. Uh, but it is a large area of land, and the question now is, who is going into uh, the kingdom? The kingdom was what was promised to Israel. It was uh, fulfillment, or it will be, fulfillment of all the prophecies where God has promised them that they would be in that land forever. He promised to sit on an earthly throne in Yerushalayim. All of this we'll keep touching on again and again. So they are at this point, because the tribulation has ended, they are before the Lord for whether they get to go into the kingdom or not. We are going to look... Uh, well, last week we looked at the, the Gentile nations that are judged, and we see that it came down individually. We saw especially from Matthew 25, where the, in summary where the Lord said that they gave him a cup of cold water, they gave him food, they visited him in prison, etc., etc., and they said, you know, when did we do that? And he said, when you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. In the context that the setting is in, we realize, I've got, oh, okay, someone was coming to the door, but it's just a delivery, sorry. <laughs> I thought I was going to have to answer the door. Um, in the context, we see that he is obviously talking about his human brethren, the Jewish people, because he was born into the Jewish race. And so if he is saying that you did it to the Jewish ones who were in need, our mind immediately goes to 144,000 that uh, would not uh, be able to buy and sell according to the Antichrist. They would need food and clothing and sheltering. And then those who came to salvation through their ministry, also who are being hunted down and not willing to take the mark, would be in need. And there would be those who would be helping them. We saw the idea of it in the Holocaust. But here again, the point that I'm bringing out is it was be Gentiles that he was referring to that helped the Jewish people who were in need. The only ones that are going to do that are the ones who have faith in the Lord, who realize that it's more important to be obedient to the Lord than it is to even keep themselves alive on this earth, that if they died for what they did, they would be immediately in the presence of our Lord, that they would not lose anything but gain eternity with the Lord. So here, because of the context, verse 40, especially is the verse where it refers to the Jewish people as his brethren, then it's showing us that these would be what, uh, um, well, Yad Vashem calls them the righteous Gentiles. These are Gentiles who have faith in the Lord, who helped the Jewish people, and I believe they'll also be helping fellow um, Christians that are believers in the Lord Jesus also during the tribulation time. Then we start to look also at the fact that there's a judgment on the Jewish people, a judgment on Israel. And we looked last time, I believe we did, at Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 33 to 38, where God says he would bring them into judgment with him at this time. Uh, Malachi, Malachi chapter 3, verses 2 through 5 also told us that, that uh, this great coming day of the Lord, this judgment called the tribulation, would be bringing and coming to a culmination where the Lord comes back, judges those uh, nations that are opposed to Israel. This is when he will set up his kingdom, and now he will be judging um, on an individual basis, though, those who go into uh, this kingdom. The kingdom is the kingdom of heaven on earth. The rule of the Lord as it is in heaven, so it will be on earth. Um, it will be a wonderful time when he is ruling, as Psalm 2 says, with a rod of iron. It is going to be um, 
a, a righteous and a just rule, something this world has never known. The best it's been has never known that. When we get into looking at the description of the Millennial Kingdom after we look at who goes in, then we'll see a little more of the characteristics. There's quite a few, but I can bring them out, I think, rather quickly. So um, I think better to stay on topic right now. Let's look at Matthew 13. Let's start with verse 36 in Matthew 13. We're going to see again that he's talking about another group in a parable, and uh, actually this is the explanation of the parable, and I think we can just jump in there with his Talmudim, with his disciples, and understand a bit more about this kingdom of heaven that's come down to the earth at this point. Um, verse 36 says, He, Yeshua, Jesus, left the crowds, went into the house, and his Talmudim, his disciples, came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. And he said, so here's our explanation according to the Lord. It's wonderful when he explains it. I love it. <laughs> the one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. Son of Man is a Messianic title right there. We know that's referring to Yeshua Jesus. Sowing the seed would be sowing the word of God. Uh, the weeds are the sons of the evil one. Well, who's the evil one in relation to the Son of Man? We know is Satan. So the, we now have two groups of people. We have... Um, the sons of the kingdom, did I read it? I, I jumped too far. Okay, we have the, the let's, let me just go in order. The field is the world. As for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. These are the ones who will be going into the kingdom. That means they belong to the Lord. And the weeds are the sons of the evil one. Weeds are never good, are they? We know they're not. Verse 39, the enemy who sowed them, sowed those weeds, is the devil. Makes it very clear, spells it out. And the harvest is at the end of the age. Now remember in Jewish thought, Jewish terminology, end of the age, is that time when Messiah comes and sets up the rulership and rules the entire world from his throne on earth. That's keeping in mind that Matthew is Jewish and he's writing to a Jewish audience and they know nothing of what we call the church age. It hasn't begun yet. It's not part of this. So he is simply giving a direct answer about the Jewish timeline. And we see then the end of the age would be the time that we're at right now and the reapers are angels. Uh, last week we talked about the angels going throughout the four corners of the earth, that means all around the globe, and bringing the Jewish people back to go into their homeland to live in Israel where they belong at this time. The ones that, that have survived, the ones who are believers, are the ones who the angels are bringing who will go into the kingdom. We'll get more of that as we go on. So, verse 40, just as the weeds are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man, Messianic title, Yeshua Jesus, will send forth his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. They will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let me stop right there. What's cast out of this kingdom, not going to be allowed into the kingdom, is the lawlessness, the ones who have been committing lawlessness, who have put up stumbling blocks for others to not follow the Lord. This is the unbelievers. They will be cast out. They are not allowed into the kingdom. There will be no lawlessness allowed in the kingdom. And so they are cast out. Verse 42 says, into a furnace of fire that does make us think of hell. And it quite likely is, I do believe that they will stand at the great white throne judgment, which we have not come to yet. So they, they're in a place like a holding tank, maybe in the heart of the earth still, as we've talked before about Sha'ol having the two compartments, and we know the paradise side has been lifted out, but the suffering side had not. Maybe that's where they go into that place of suffering while they're waiting to stand at the great white throne judgment to be judged individually, mm -hmm. and then into the lake of fire, which is where they have chosen to go. No one goes to hell because God sent them. They go because they sent themselves. Rejection of his son and his son's atoning work, the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, 
is what is the criteria. If you've accepted the Lord, you are washed in his blood, you have eternal salvation, you will not suffer the, the fires of hell. It's as simple as that. If you don't like that, I'm sorry, God made the rules and he has a right to make the rules. And really they are very fair and just. If they have not wanted to be one with him and they do not love him, why would they want to spend a thousand years with him ruling and reigning and an eternity with him? They have chosen that that's not what they want, that in their pride or in their whatever, they believe that, that they have a better idea than that. And they will find that anything they could think of, anything that they think should be right and just, apart from the perfect standard of God's holiness, falls short. And the consequences are severe, but they have chosen it for themselves. Someone once said you have to crawl over the body of Jesus to get into hell, and that's really true, because he did lay down his life for the world. Okay, so what about the others? Verse 43, the righteous, those who are in saving faith and believing, they will shine forth like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. In the kingdom of God, the kingdom that, that Yeshua Jesus is representing from heaven, sitting on earth. The one who has ears, let him hear. That reminds us of the phrase repeated to the church age, but it's not done quite in the same way, and it's not meant to be to the church age, because the church hasn't begun yet. This is saying, for those right here and now, let them hear what is being said. Remember, it's our willful stubbornness that closes off our hearing from hearing the voice of the Lord. He's always drawing people to him. It's up to them to open and allow him to come in. Um, let, me look at, uh, let me look with you at Matthew 24 and show you from that that is individual faith that is necessary even within the nation of Israel. And this will give us that relation because some people think, oh, they're Jewish. They've got it made. We don't need to worry about them. They've got an in with God. Well, that's not true. It's individual, and every individual must ask the Lord into their heart and procure salvation for themselves. You can't do it for someone else. No one else can do it for you, and it is the individual choice. Now, Matthew 24, we know, has given us order. We've gone from the beginning telling us what is the end of the age We've gone into the explanation of that. The Lord gave the signs of the coming tribulation, the tribulation signs, the coming of the, the Lord and his second coming down to earth at this time, what we're talking about. Now we're down to verse 42, and I want you to see that it is referring to individual faith. 42 says, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. A lot of people apply that to the rapture. It is true. We do not know when the rapture will occur, but that's not what's being referred to. Remember, we keep this in order, and we just saw in verses 36 and following, in fact, 36 says again, the day and the hour, no one knows. And then it tells what the coming of the Son of Man would be like. The coming of the Son of Man would be like in the days of Noah. They were eating and drinking before the flood came. They were marrying, giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. They had no, um, they weren't convicted of, of anything wrong in the eyes of God. They were right in their own eyes and they were living life and, and what did you say? I said clue. The clueless, yes, clueless about about the, the the Lord's coming. And here we saw very clearly they did not understand till the flood took them away. I'll get your question in one second, Rosa. Remind me if I don't. Um, the flood came and took them away. How did the flood take them away? That was in judgment. So when we see that it says, so will the coming of the Son of Man be, we're talking about when the Son of Man comes and there is judgment. When the rapture occurs, it is not judgment against the people who are involved in the rapture. It's our reward. We're getting to go home to be with the Lord. Yes, judgment falls on the earth, but remember we're talking in That's sync here. Lost. Yes, lost. yes, to the lost. <laughs> At the time, two men are in the field. One's taken in judgment. One's left to go into the kingdom. Two women are grinding at the mill. One's taken in judgment. The other's left to go into the kingdom. The ones that are left to go into the kingdom are the ones who are alert. Verse 42, 
because they don't know what the day that's coming. How many times have you been sharing your faith with someone and they say, oh, well, I'll do it another time. I'll do it in the future. I want to think about it. Or, you know, I'm just not convinced for today. And they want to put it off. That's dangerous because they don't know. Even with the, the activities of the tribulation, we know the days are cut short because God said if it wasn't, there'd be no flesh left alive. So the return of the Son of Man will be sudden. They can know approximately the time that's coming, but the only ones who are going to know that are the ones who are into the scriptures, studying them and seeing them. The unsaved aren't going to have that roadmap laid out before them, understand it and reject it. They're just plain rejecting because they're like these in the day of Noah. They don't care. They, as long as they can put food on their table and they can live their lives, if they need to take the mark, so what? They'll take the mark is, is the attitude that we're seeing. But the, the uh, Son of Man will come, judgment will come. Verse 43 says, be sure of this. If the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you must be ready as well. For the Son of Man's coming at an hour when you don't think he will. You might think you've got it all figured out. No, you've got time, but you, you could be surprised and find out that you didn't know. Notice I emphasized at night, the thief in the night. Now, I'm not saying that the Lord is a thief at all. But if you go to 1 Thessalonians, and later we'll look it up, so I'm just referencing it right now. I believe it's in chapter 5 that it talks also like this about the thief that comes at night. And then it says, but you, and Thessalonians was written to believers. You believers are not of the night. You are not of the darkness. You're children of the day. See the contrast? So we're not talking about believers now and the rapture. We're talking about unbelievers who are in desperate need of waking up or they're going to face the judgment at the time of the beginning of the millennium. We're looking forward to this return, so we're watching for him. This is we true. Believers now we're are watching looking for forward him. and watching for him. And I yes. was on TV and they were saying, those that don't think the rapture is near is asleep at the will. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was good. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay, so verse 45, Who then is the faithful and the sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household slaves to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. I'm wondering how much maybe I need to... Um, Okay, let me, yeah, let me just define this as we're going along, because if I go and read to the end, I'll lose you. Notice that it's talking to a household of slaves, okay? Israel was to be the servant nation to the world. They were to be the kingdom of priests. They were to carry the message to the world, okay? Now, the nation of Israel is who Yeshua is talking about when he talks in general to the Jewish people, who were to be that servant, Okay, um, verse 45 says he made him rulers over his household or put him in charge over his household. Um, that would be even a picture of in the kingdom, those who will rule and who will reign with him. Their faithfulness during the tribulation period will prove their faith. It doesn't save them, but it proves their faith. You can know who saved them, not by their actions during the tribulation. Blessed is the slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes, doing what he was supposed to do, helping the others, taking the word of God to the others. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. Those Jewish people who came through the millennial time who did well, I mean through the tribulation time, who did well in it will be rewarded in ruling with him during the millennial kingdom. Okay, um, and by the way, if you want where I have the Israel as a servant nation, it's Shemot, Exodus, chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. You can read it there on your own. Um, it's not saying that the Gentiles were, this was expected of them. Remember, God chose the Jewish people, a peculiar people, to be his treasure. He chose the smaller so that it would show it is his might and it is his power and it is all him. It's not the people. And he would work through them to the saving of all the nations. But it, it, the Gentiles were never under the, um, the rule, the commandment to be the speaker to the world in Israel's time there. Okay? 
So how far am I reading? I want to read through 51, and I haven't. So the master who's doing well, uh, I mean the servant who's doing well when the master comes, will be rewarded with ruling in the kingdom. Verse 48, but if the evil slave says in his heart, my master's not coming for a long time, he begins to beat his fellow slaves. He eats and he drinks with them, with those habitually drunk. Remember, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. They're not in a relationship with the Lord. Those are the ones that then the master of that slave will come. The master of those, he's coming to all of Israel. He's not coming just to the saved. He's coming physically to the, the land of Israel, which is made up of believing and non-believing Jewish people at this time, also believing and non-believing Gentiles, but in generality we're speaking of the Jews right now. So these Jewish people who were not following him, not being obedient to him, who are, are living the, the worldly life because he's not in them, they don't know he's going to come, verse 50. Uh, the, the, the master's slave will come on a day that he does not expect and an hour he does not know and he will cut him in two assign him a place with the hypocrites we know from revelation the hypocrites are not in heaven the hypocrites their place is in hell and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth that's how miserable they'll be that the, the crying is constant and they're grinding their teeth in their pain because they're separated from the love of God but uh, notice here that these are Jewish unbelievers that suffer that consequence. So obviously Jewish believers will be the ones ruling and reigning with him in the millennial. So we see one group, the born-again believing Jewish people, who will go into the kingdom by these verses. <clears throat> Let me also take you to Matthew 25. Um, will they be suffering mentally and physically in hell? It sounds like it. It sounds like an emotional and a physical reaction to it. So the anguish will be horrendous. Yes, yes. Now, let me tell you with uh, Matthew 25. We're looking at some more parables, okay? Um, um, Brenda has a question. Oh, and Rosa had a question. Rosa did too. Brenda, let me go to Rosa first. Rose? Brenda's doing this and I'm not understanding what she no, means. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, turned off. I, I, I need a go ahead, Brenda. No, no. No? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me go to Rosa then. I was just pointing. Rosa on my screen, she's right below me. Oh, so I was just Okay, and you were side by side, you weren't below, but thank um, you for reminding sorry. me, and Rosa, my apologies. Yes, ma'am, your question. And unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, there. I guess I, I wanted to ask this question because I heard you say it um, when we were in Matthew thir um, 13. Okay. Uh, where you said, like, if people... People pass away now. They go to a, a holding place. Is that what you're saying? Yes. They don't go directly to hell. Right. Right. Okay. Yes. The hell right now, hell is constant, continual. It was made for the devil and his angels. That's Matthew 25, verse 41. I'm in Matthew 40 or 41. Let me see which one it is. It is <clears throat> verse 41. Okay. Yes. When he tells those, and we'll see who he's judging at this point also, but when he tells them they're going into eternal fire, that's the lake of fire, that's hell, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. It was not prepared and meant for man. When man brought sin into the world, he brought judgment on himself and the consequence of also ending up in hell if he does not turn to the Lord for his salvation. So... It's not that hell, we say it. We say when they leave this earth, they go to heaven or hell. Actually, literally, when you leave this earth, if you're a believer, yes, you go into heaven now, into the presence of the Lord. You used to go, everyone used to go into Sheol. Sheol was in the heart of the earth. Sheol had a paradise side that would be a euphoria like heaven, but it wasn't heaven because the blood hadn't been put on the mercy seat in heaven yet to procure our salvation. Sins were covered 
once the blood was put on that mercy seat at the death of Yeshua on the cross, then sins were now washed away. That meant that now we could go into the presence of a holy God because the sins were completely gone, not just covered by the blood of the lambs waiting in view of the perfect sinless blood that would come. Sinless blood placed there. We saw the Lord emptied out the paradise side of Sheol, took it into heaven so that Paul would say to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Well, the Lord's at the right hand of the Father in heaven. He's not in Sheol now. He went into Sheol, into the paradise side for three days, three nights, right after the crucifixion, rose from the dead. And then when he ascended 40 days later, he ascended into heaven. He did not ascend into Sheol. He ascended into heaven the blood's been on the, the mercy seat. Heaven's ready. He's sitting on the right hand of the Father, waiting for the Father to make his enemies his footstool, which we saw happen at the, the, the wrath that God poured out in the tribulation, bringing them to that point, and the Lord coming back, just finishing it off with the sword out of his mouth, trampling the wine press. The blood that, that is spilled is horrendous, but then the believing ones are now going into the kingdom. All through time, those who did not believe and left earth went into the suffering side of Sheol. And I believe that's where they still go, even in 2021, into the suffering side of Sheol. When they have stood at the great white throne and been individually judged, because no one sent into hell on the basis of someone else's actions. It's on the basis of their own. At that point, it's determined how, how severe their suffering will be for all of eternity. We don't know and understand that any more than what I'm saying, but we've got a righteous God who is righteous and just in his dealings. We know it will be right. We just, we know it will be. To me, they're in hell, period, that suffering, you know, that Bottom line, the best the best one goes into hell goes into hell. But at that great white throne, they're judged individually, and then they're cast into the lake of fire forever. Okay, yeah. go ahead, Rosa. Yes, so then, uh, just to clarify then, you cannot pray anybody out of show. How do you say that? Show? No, you cannot. No, you cannot. that's exactly what I, what I believe that you cannot do that because okay. the word says that you've got to make the decision before you go to it's, before you die. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. That's Hebrews 10, 27. It tells you in 31, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a righteous, of a judging God, I think is the word used. Yes. Um, that tells us judgment comes after death. Either the judgment that says we're, we're permitted into heaven, the joyful judgment, or the judgment that will send us into the consequences finally that are in hell. Luke 16 gives us the best picture. It is not a parable. Matthew 25 is parables. Like somebody said, when you read a parable, you get a lot. It's, it's bringing you a, a specific point, but you get other points along with it. But a parable cannot, you can't make a parable walk on four legs, okay? In other words, every single detail of a parable, you don't understand it in all its detail and know exactly what it means. You get the gist of it. You get the idea. It's like when we use a picture to try to get our point across and that picture isn't quite perfect. I'll give you a quick example. We'll say the egg is a picture of the Trinity. It's shell, it's white, and it's yolk. It's three, but it's one. That's a good picture, but here's where it falls down. The shell is not equal to the white. The white's not equal to the yolk. They're all three unequal parts. Our triunity of our God is equal. Mm -hmm. There's nothing on this earth that we can find that's equal that we can use to picture our triune God. So we use things like water, vapor, um, and ice. We use the egg. We use different things. Parables, you can only get that overall point that it's supposed to be coming across. When it's a story, it's a true story, it's a life story, then you're not dealing with that. When the Lord named the person in Luke 16, he names him by name, Lazarus. When the poor beggar Lazarus died, as soon as he put a name on it, he never used names of parables. That took it out of the parable and put it into the reality. Lazarus was a real beggar. It was a person that they probably, some of the people there hearing knew him. It was 
it, it, it's a real it's fact. Reality. It's reality. Thank you. Perfect. It's reality. So in Luke 16, Lazarus goes into the paradise site. It's called Abraham's bosom. The same way we give different names to um, a, a place. It's just another. The idea is you they're being comforted with Abraham. Okay, and it, it was believed that Abraham was in that paradise site of Sheol because the cross has not happened yet. That hasn't been emptied out yet. So Lazarus goes, and he's been comforted. There's a great valley. It's like mountain peaks and a great valley, which, by the way, science has discovered that the heart of the earth is made up of peaks and valleys and peaks and valleys. It just goes right along with this. You give science long enough, they prove the Bible every time. They are not against each other. They work hand in hand together, and there are brilliant scientists that can reveal that to you. So don't buy the lie that science and the Bible don't get along. No, they absolutely do. Time and time again, every way you look at the Bible, mathematically, geographically, scientifically, prophetically, it has never failed. That's just for free. Let me get back on track. The the um, he's he's being comforted. He sees uh, on the other side, the suffering side. Apparently, they could see, but it gives you the idea it was a distance. It's not like it was up front in their face. Anyway, the the one there, the rich man had rejected the Lord, ended up in the suffering site. He sees Lazarus, and he wants to be comforted. He asks, you know, Abraham, let him come over. Let him just dip his finger in the water, put on my tongue. He was so parched and so thirsty and suffering so much. And Abraham said, no one can cross. No one goes and comes back. There's no crossing in between. Now, that, they were in juxtaposition to see mountains and a valley at that point. Now we're like this. One's down still in the heart of the earth, one's in heaven, but the property is still the same. There's no crossing back and forth. Obviously, no one from heaven is going to lose and leave heaven. How could they? But no one can be prayed out of or find a way to work themselves out of the eternal punishment that they went into. The decision is made before you leave this earth. And that's why we need to talk to people today and share our, our, our faith with them today that they might hear and the Spirit of God tug at their hearts and they turn to Him the same way we have. Each and every individual person has to make that choice for themselves. To not choose is to reject. There's no middle of the road there's no sitting on the fence. We talk about that when we say someone's getting close to believing, but again, that's a euphemism. That's an idea that we're expressing. But if they were to lose their life on that day that you think they're sitting on the fence, they have not accepted so that obviously then they have rejected. It's, it's a, an either or. There's no in between. So you are either saved because you invited Jesus into your heart, you are eternally saved, or you have not yet done that, and you're at this point lost and in danger of eternal loss. When does it become eternity? The split second you've left this earth. Because the Spirit lives on. The Spirit was what God breathed in Adam. He became a living being. That cannot die. God cannot die. So the Spirit has to live on. And it all and has soul. to be settled now. The soul and the spirit never die. Right. So when the, uh, this is how I look at it, when the, the bad, they go to, I call it, like, I call it jail, <laughs> and then they get out of jail to be judged, <laughs> okay. and then they go to prison, which is the lake of fire. <laughs> so that's how I look at it. Okay. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if you all heard Pam. Let me repeat it. The way that she looks at it is, if they die and they did not believe, they've gone to jail. Then they get out of jail just to stand at their trial, at their judgment, with God the judge sitting on the throne. When God sentences them, they're sent not back to jail, but to prison, where it's forever, okay? <laughs> Which is the lake of fire. So that's just her way of putting it. Pat, Patty loved it. It, it. Cuts the red tape. Okay, so again, that's why I'm stressing here we're talking about individuals um, when we're looking at this. It, there, no one, nowhere in Scripture do we ever see salvation referred to for um, a nation. It's always the individual. When it talks about all of Israel will be saved in Romans 11, it's talking about a national, it's talking about the nation of Israel that will not cease to exist. 
that uh, when the Lord returns, the nation at that point then will be those who believe in Yeshua. They look up and they see the one who's coming. They know he's the one who they pierce. They've accepted him as Messiah, and they're the ones going into the kingdom saying, Baruch HaBaba Shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's what it's time about. Paul didn't mean when he said that in Romans 11. And remember, 9, 10, and 11 talked to us about Israel past, Israel present, and Israel future, 9, 10, and 11 uh, perspective respectively respectively so 11 is telling us about the future of the nation of israel it's not talking about individuals no one gets into god's eternal heaven on the basis of a nation on the basis of another person on the basis of anything but personal acceptance of yeshua jesus okay everybody on the same page <laughs> okay so let's go ahead and go back. Did I read all I wanted here? Oh, no, I just took us, didn't I? I took us to Matthew 25. Okay, and I wanted you to understand that there is this means, the standard of judgment at the Messiah's return. 24 has brought us to the point of his return. We saw that he came, and we see here in these verses that there is a judgment when he comes back down to earth, to the Mount of Olives, to setting up his kingdom, to ruling from Jerusalem, that there is a judgment. Um, verse 41, did I get to that point? No, I didn't. I did I kept back short of that. Verse 40, the king, um, well, verses 37, 38, you know, that's all those that I alluded to, that he, they, they help the stranger, the naked, the one sick, needing food, water, whatever, okay? And the king answers and says, Truly I say, to the extent you did it for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. You did it to, to the, the um, people that were in need. This is the ones who are believing in faith. They did it because if they're not in faith, they're not going to help the one who's against Antichrist. They'd be afraid of, of suffering the consequences themselves. So... Then he says, those who, uh, then he will say to those on his left, okay, where did we get the left? Did I skip that part? Um, 41. I, I did skip it. We have, whoops, we have to go back up to verses 31, 32, 31 sets the scene. The Son of Man comes, his angels have come with him, and he sits on his glorious throne. All of that is key words that let us know this is second coming. When he comes in rapture, he doesn't come sit on the throne. The angels aren't coming with him. It's not the Son of Man in all his glory being seen, except by those who are being ushered with him back into heaven. Okay? And remember, he catches us up in the air. So this obviously is his second coming. Verse 32 says, The nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them one from another, just as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. The sheep are on the right, the goats are on the left. The sheep, his sheep, hear his voice, his sheep know him. Okay, so verse 41, those on the left, depart from me, you accursed people, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. That's why some think that they immediately go into hell, but I still see that they've got to stand at the great white throne. So I think they go into the holding tank in preparation, the jail ready for the prison, okay, that Pam just referred to. And he tells them that they went because they didn't, he was hungry, they didn't feed, feed him. He was thirsty, they didn't give him drink. Stranger, they didn't invite him in. All these different ways that they could have done to show their faith in the one that they should have been believing in, they did not. So, verse um, 45 says, Then he answers to them and says, Truly I say to you, to the extent you did not do it for one of the least of these, you didn't do it for me either. If you'd had faith in me, you would have done it for me. You don't have faith in me, so you didn't do it for me. They will go away into eternal punishment. Here again, see, you can't pray them out. There's no purgatory. There's no way to get them out. There's no, you know, second chance. None of that. The righteous will go into eternal life. The others go into the eternal punishment. So it makes it clear what, um, that there's a split here, and only the ones going into the kingdom now are going to be believers. They will be, whoops, I went too far. They will be um, Jewish believers. They will be Gentile believers. When we look at Matthew 25, there we go. We're going to look at several parables Okay, remember, again, our parables, we can't walk on all fours. We're, we might find something we don't quite understand, and we limp a little. But we're going to get 
the major point out of it. We're going to see and understand. The first two measures of standard of judgment at the Messiah's return deal with the Jewish people who will go into the kingdom. Okay, then we talk again about the Gentiles. Let's go and let's look at this and see why I can say that, okay? <clears throat> um, and because there's enough confusion out there, I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on Matthew 25. I'm going to try to do it quickly, but I did last week. I asked about whether I should go into detail or not. This week, I'm impressed by the Lord. I need to spell it out. So um, bear with me if it seems a little long in Matthew, but we are moving along. We just want to make it clear. Matthew 25 starts with the kingdom of heaven. That gives us our timing, the kingdom of heaven that's coming down to earth, okay, in the millennial reign. So the kingdom of heaven is comparable to ten virgins. Oh, let me stop before I go into the virgins. Let me start with the word then. Then is a word that gives us time. If I say da-da-da-da-da and then he did this and this and that, you've got a time. You know, the, what came before was before, and that word then connects it, but it's something after. And when we keep remembering that Matthew was not written with chapters and verses, it was one long letter, we go back and we look for, okay, what's our time order? Well, we'll see the, verse, the word then in verse 29 of chapter 24. We see it in verse 30. We see it in verse 40, and now we see it in verse 25, I'm sorry, verse 1 of chapter 25. So in 24, 29, 30, and 40, then this will happen, then this will happen, then this will happen, and now in 25, 1, and then this will happen. Now, if I, because I've taught you before, let you just go for the ride with me and not the detail, let me remind you, 24, 29, then the tribulation. Matthew 24, 30, then the second coming. Matthew 24, 40, then the judgment that we're talking about right now. And Matthew 25, 1, then the kingdom. So we've got tribulation, son of man return, a judgment for who goes into the kingdom with him. Then, 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 and then. Okay, so then the kingdom of heaven, the millennial kingdom. This is not rapture talk. I'm not talking about going up to heaven. I'm not talking to the believing called out assembly, which is really what the church is, the church age is. We're talking about the millennial kingdom. We're talking about on this earth, okay? Then, the kingdom of heaven will be comparable or will be likened to ten virgins, okay? It's going to resemble this. Remember a parable? We get the idea. We get the just. So, ten virgins, there's really no special reason for the number ten. It just represents that there was a professing nation of Israel, okay? There were professing believers in the nation of Israel, all right? Now, we're not talking about the bride. And if you hold on to that thought, it's going to help you a whole lot because people often confuse the attendance with the bride. We're not talking about the bride. We're talking about her attendance. Okay? Keep that in mind because I think you all know who the bride is. Okay? And by the way, this is not a polygamous wedding. <laughs> the Lord is married to one bride. <laughs> there are many attendants, but there is one bride. Okay? Um, Any time the called out assembly, the church is talked about in prophetic scripture, it is never as a number of individuals, but always as one body. So before you go and say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, the bride of Christ is made up of many, yes, but we're referred to as one body. We're all the body of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.2, a chaste virgin not virgins, a chaste virgin that's being presented to the Lord is how Paul refers to us. It's always singular, one lump grouped together. So one bride, yes, made up of many, but, but all considered one. Okay, so now we've got ten. We've got a company of virgins. We don't have just one. And we see that they, um, where are they? They took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. The lamp is a torch with a place um, 
For a wick, I should have thought I could have brought you a little sample. I could run upstairs and get it, but for sake of time, I'll, I'll move on. At the end, if someone reminds me, I'll run up and get my little virgin's lamp that I got from Israel. That's an idea of what it was like back then. But anyway, there was a light that could be carried. Remember, they don't have electricity. They don't have street lights. They don't have ways and means of seeing of getting around in the dark. And so they had little lights that they would carry with them, lamps. And there were niches in the homes that they would put these little lamps into. So they would take their light from room to room. Are we thankful for electricity today? <laughs> yeah, I am. Okay, anyway, in Scripture, the lamp is a picture, a symbol of the Word of God. Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Okay, the Word of God is a lamp to us. It's a light to us. Okay, let me show you real quick. I'm going to sidetrack us for just a moment. Hold on to Matthew 25, but let me take you to Romans 3. And well, I want to go to the Word of God, right? The lamp is the Word of God. Psalm 119, 105. Okay, um, chapter 3 of Romans and verse 2. Paul's been asked, what advantage does a Jewish person have then? If they don't have to be circumcised for salvation now, you know, if all of this is, is going away, then what advantage does the Jew have? Does he have any advantage? And Paul says, yes, in every respect, he has a great advantage. What is the Jew's advantage? First, they were entrusted with the actual words of God. Okay, so the Jewish nation was given the words of God to be a light to the nations, okay? They sat in darkness, they saw a great light. The Messiah came to them, brought light to them, whether they accepted it or not. Look at Isaiah 62, 1. Let me go there real quickly, uh, because I think you all would agree Isaiah is talking about his Jewish nation. Isaiah 62, 1 says, For Zion's sake, Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. See, the salvation is the light. The word of God brings salvation. That's the light and the lamp. And Israel was entrusted with it and was to give it out to the other nations. Now, let's go to 2 Peter, 2 Kepha. We're jumping into... Um, almost the end of our new covenant, Second Peter, go to chapter 1. Second Peter, chapter 1, and verse 19. Whoops. Okay. So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Till the day dawns, the morning star arises in your hearts. Till you can see it, the prophetic word of God is a light who had the prophetic word of God? The prophets. They were of Israel. You don't have Gentile prophets, you have Jewish prophets. Israel was given the light. The light was to shine in a dark place, which was the world. Okay? Now, um, let's see. Do I want to get this point now? Maybe I need to look at Matthew 25. They've got the lamps, and they're going out to meet the groom. Um, what I'm getting to is being anointed. Maybe I will. Maybe I will. Okay. Look with me also. I should totally keep your finger there, but you can always listen if you don't have time to look. We're going back to Isaiah instead of chapter 62. We're going back one chapter prior. We're going back to 61. In Isaiah 61 and verse 1, it says, in Isaiah speaking, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord anointed me to bring good news to the humble. He sent me, and this is a, actually prophetically speaking of more than Isaiah. This is prophetically speaking of the Lord, of Yeshua Jesus. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim release to the captives, freedom to the prisoners, proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. All of that, the Lord's going to quote that in Luke 4, I think it is. He will quote these very words because he's the one it was speaking of. It was the prophetic word, but notice that the Lord anointed. There's an anointing on the word of God, and those who are to prophetically speak it, the anointing comes on them. Let me show you in, in the New Covenant. Let's go to Acts 10, Acts 10, verse 38. Go to Acts 10, 38, and we read Acts 10, 38. You know of Yeshua Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and with power, 
how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Remember when Nicodemus went to uh, Yeshua at night? And he said, we know you're from God because of the works you do. No one could do what you do if you weren't from God. He was all on the right track. He just needed a little bit more, needed to come to understand he's not just sent from God. He was very God in the person of the Son of Man, fulfilling the prophetic scriptures that spoke of him. So anointing, the Holy Spirit comes on to anoint the Word of God, okay? The Spirit's actions are what consecrate. They're what heal. They're what empower. Even what empowered Yeshua to do the miraculous works that he did, it was the Spirit of God on him working through him. Um, the symbol is that I'm trying to get across the symbolism is that the Holy Spirit is involved, that it's the Holy Spirit um, that is acting. It was the Holy Spirit that anointed the prophets, the priests, and the king. Okay? That's, that's uh, in all of them, I think. There was a verse that I had, it might have been, let me check real quick, if it's not there, I don't want to give you the wrong reference, and I'll have to give you the reference later. Um, it might be back where we're at. Yeah, it's not there. Let's go back to Matthew, I might find it here. I, I will be finding it in understanding as we go into verse 3 here. Okay, so. We've got ten virgins. They've got lamps. That means that they've been given the word of God. They're representative of the Jewish nation. They are going out to meet the groom. Okay, they went out. It's an outward profession of their loyalty to the coming king. They look like they are for him, and they're going out to the coming king to meet him. Um, I lost my place. Sorry. Went out to meet the groom. I, I said it. Or your scripture might say the bridegroom. Uh, Old King James definitely says the bridegroom. Okay the, okay, the bridegroom would go to his bride's house. She's been betrothed to him. He has gone to prepare a place for her. When he has the place ready, he goes to her house, gets her, and brings her back to his house. This is the, it's called the Oriental Custom. It doesn't mean the Orient, like Japan, places like that. It means the, the Eastern, Mideastern um, time, the, the culture that was there, okay? So he would take the bride back to his house there would be a resumption of festivities there at his house there would be the marriage feast the week of, of feasting um and and they would go on together i'm gonna say forever and by the way that some of the ancient manuscripts here say that these virgins went out to meet the groom and the bride it's not in some of the better manuscripts, but it's in other manuscripts that, that have our scriptures also. The Syrian and the Latin Vulgate um, have it. The bride, they went out to meet the bridegroom and the bride. Anyway, don't have to push the point because our, our picture is going to show us. So verse 2, five of them were foolish, five of them were prudent. Five again is a... Uh, number just a number it's not something that we can draw specifically on but we're seeing that outwardly they all looked alike but now we have a division five were in this group five were in this group wise means that they were prudent about having the oil we're going to see that as the story goes on they were prudent to have the oil with them the foolish didn't think ahead didn't have that wisdom or didn't have that desire to take the oil with them I would liken the foolish to 2 Timothy 3, 5. Let me take you there for a moment. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5, where we will read. 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, where we read, Holding to a form of godliness. Look good on the outside, although they denied its power. They denied the power of God. Avoid such people as these. Okay, now, keep that in mind. They look like they have the Holy Spirit. They look like the others, but they're going to deny the power of it because they're foolish. They're more interested in the party than in the bridegroom. Okay? Do we know people like that? That, uh, you know, put on their religious... Pam got it. <laughs> she got it right on. They put on the religious errors, but it's not what's in their heart. Okay? So they took no oil. Now, I've already begun to show you oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you one verse to look at, um, one area to look at, and then I'll give you other verses to save a little bit of time. Go with me to Zechariah. That's Zechariah. 
Chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. Okay? Zechariah chapter 4. I always want, whoops, I always want scripture to prove my point because remember, you don't believe it because Rochelle says it. You don't believe it because anybody says it. You believe it because the Word of God says it. You see it in the Word of God, believe it. You don't see it in the Word of God, don't believe it. That's the criteria. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1. The angel who had been speaking with me returned, woke me up like a person who's awakened from his sleep and said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see, and behold, a lampstand. Here's your lamp, okay? All of gold with this bowl on the top of it, seven lamps on, with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on top of it. We've got the menorah like what you see in the temple being pictured, okay? <coughs> verse 4, um, then I said, the angel who is speaking, what are these, my Lord? And the angel who was speaking with me said, do you not know? And I said, no, my Lord. So then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord, okay? Now we're getting, we're hearing the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of armies. What are you, you great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you become a plain, and he will bring out the top stone, the capping, shouting grace, grace to it. Okay? So 1 through 7, we are seeing that the light, the lamp, is the spirit. The power is the spirit. Drop down to verses 11 through 14. What are, then I said to him, what are the two olive trees on the right of the lampstand on its left? And I responded the second time and said, what are the two olive branches which are beside the golden pipes which empty the golden oil from themselves? So the oil flows to these that are standing on the side. And he said, do you not know? And I said, no, my Lord. Verse 14, then he said, these are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. So see how the oil flowed onto the anointed. The Holy Spirit brings that anointing. So when they didn't take the oil, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. They weren't anointed by the Lord. They didn't have the Word of God in their hearts. They've got an outward facade, but inwardly they've got nothing. <clears throat> now you can look, um, we already read Isaiah 61.1. It goes along with it. You can look at Zechariah, Zechariah 12.10. Um, if you want the anointing that I mentioned, the anointing of the kings and the priests, that's Leviticus 8, verse 12. That's 1 Samuel 10 and verse 1, and also in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 13. So continually we see in the Old Testament the symbol of God's anointing with his Holy Spirit. Psalm 23 is a very familiar, let me read verse 5 to you with that in mind, because sometimes we get so accustomed to the familiar we miss the, the detail of it. Verse 5 said, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. The oil being a picture of the Holy Spirit. How is David, the psalmist, anointed? By the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, back to our ten versions. virgins. Five of them we know now have the Holy Spirit within. And five of them we know don't. And in verse 5 we read, while the groom was delaying, remember there's time that has transpired. We already know that. We're into thousands of years here at this point. <clears throat> while the groom was delaying, they all became drowsy. <sighs> they began to sleep. Okay? They nodded off. This shows that it, from the Greek um, that it was written and that it was continually. They kept nodding off. They kept falling asleep. It's kind of like they get stirred and there's an interest and then it wears off and it wears off. Well, how do we relate to that? Look at Romans 11 and verses 7 and 8. Romans 11, verses 7 and 8. Now, remember what I said about Romans 11? Come on, go. I said it's talking about Israel future. We're talking about Israel here. We're not talking about Gentiles. We're talking about Israel. What then? What Israel is seeking is not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, the rest were hardened. Some of Israel received the Holy Spirit. Remember when Shaul Paul said, not all who are Israel are of Israel? That's what he was meaning. How can you say, well, wait a minute, I'm in Israel, I'm a Jew, how can I not be of Israel? Because those who were the ones with it, those are the ones that have the Holy Spirit or the ones that are being referred to. The rest of them that didn't have the Holy Spirit, verse 8 says, just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, 
eyes to see not, ears to hear not, down to this very day. Paul was saying all the way down to today. Now Rochelle's saying all the way down to 2021. <laughs> there are those who don't have the this Holy Spirit within, and God's given them this stupor to just, they just sleep. And you think, well, wait a minute. What's God doing? It's the same way he hardened the heart when they don't turn, hardened Pharaoh's heart. When he didn't turn to the Lord, it hardened him. When they didn't turn to the Lord, they became more, uh, it, it became harder to penetrate. We all know that. If you try to get somebody and you keep pounding and you keep pounding, they just harden themselves against it. They become more and more resistant to the point that you can't break through. It's not the way to do it, okay? Um, How would you describe them? Hard-hearted? Yes, hard-hearted, hard-hearted. That would be a good way to describe them. Yes, go to Isaiah 29.10. We'll see it there also. Isaiah 29.10. And remember what's hardened them? The truth. They've turned from the truth, and they've hardened the hearts against it. Verse 10, for the Lord has poured over you, speaking in general now to Israel who is backslidden, the Lord is, has poured over you a spirit of deep sleep. He shut your eyes, the prophets. He's covered your heads, the seers. The prophets aren't prophesying more. The seers aren't seeing more. He's given it to them. He's given it to them. He's given it to them. And what have they done with the prophets? They've taken them and killed them. They've taken them and thrown them in prison. They've pushed them aside and ignored them. So God's letting them, in essence, reap what they've sown. And their eyes are closed to it. So these five that are without... Um, and we'll see, because their big is awakened, but we'll see that the, that they they didn't have it within them, okay? Verse 6 gives us, uh, back to our story in Matthew 25, gives us what happens. Remember, they're drowsy, begin to sleep in 5 and 6, but at midnight, notice again, midnight. Remember, the night is the time of the tribulation, not the time of the the body of believers of the church age of the ecclesia, the called out assembly. We're children of the day. So this is midnight. This is speaking in relation to time of the tribulation, not in time to the church. And by the way, I want to prove that point. First Thessalonians 5, 1 to 5, real quick, because I brought it up twice now. I want to back it up. First Thessalonians 5, verse 1. Now, as to periods and times, brothers and sisters, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well the day of the Lord, Okay, day of the Lord starts with that tribulation. It goes all the way through millennium and a bit further, I think, but at least through millennium. You know full well the day of the Lord is coming like a thief in the night. When they're saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come on them like labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. They think they're fine, and they're going to find themselves in the tribulation. But you, you brothers and sisters, you Thessalonians that Paul is writing to, you are not in darkness so that the day would overtake you like a thief. You are all sons of light, sons of day. Light, lamp, Holy Spirit, sons of the day. We are not in that darkness. And it says that specifically, we are not of the night nor of the darkness. So carry that into this, and we realize that, that these who are sleeping are the ones that are without the light. At midnight, there's a shout, Behold! The bridegroom, or the groom, whichever way yours says it, behold the groom, come out to meet him. Here comes the, the, the groom, okay? It's a sudden cry. It rents out through the air. They're all hearing it. Go out to meet him. Bring him and his bride into the groom's house for the feast is the idea. I don't think it says it here, but because we know what goes on in that, that um, custom. When they had the cry, you know, here comes the groom. He'd be at the bride's house. He is bringing the bride back to his house. Now, in this case, he's got his bride with them because he's bringing the attendants. He's calling the attendants. He's not calling the bride. And remember, some of those manuscripts even made it very clear that the bride, grew, uh, the, grew, the bride <laughs> was already there. Okay, so what happens? These virgins, they got up, they trimmed their lamps, they turned on their lamps. You know, they, they probably turned down to, to conserve the oil during the night so they could turn it up when they needed it. So they trimmed their lamps, but the foolish virgins said to the, to the prudent ones, to the wise ones, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. 
Okay, fresh oil had to always be put into those lamps to keep the light going. The idea is that there was now a frantic searching through the Word of God, a frantic, wait a minute, I don't have it, I'm missing something here. But because they didn't have the Holy Spirit, they didn't discern, they didn't realize, and they weren't prepared. The ones who did have the Holy Spirit had plenty of oil. They were ready. They were ready to go when that, that call came, and they're going to go. We're going to see that. The foolish ones are saying to, to the others, give us some of yours. But the prudent ones, verse 9, answer, no, there certain, most certainly would not be enough for us and you too. Okay, this is why we say parables don't walk on all fours. <coughs> I can't give the Holy Spirit to anyone, okay? But the idea is what they had, they had within themselves. Everyone has to have their own. That's what it's meaning here. So that wasn't, you can't get into the kingdom because you went along with somebody who did believe. You had to have believed yourself. You know, they say, oh, well, I'm in a Christian family or I'm in a Christian section, you know, or, or you know, I went to church every day. My no. parents were Christian. My parents were Christian, yeah. <laughs> no, they had to have had it within themselves. It's not something that could be shared across, okay? So, and they're told to go out and buy it for themselves. Now, here again, you can't go buy the Holy Spirit. That's not what this is trying to teach. But the idea is they should have gone out, they should have searched, and they should have found the Holy Spirit for themselves because anyone who seeks God will find him. God says that in Scripture. You seek with me, with, seek for me with your whole heart. You will find him. Actually, he <clears throat> finds you. <laughs> but you weren't lost, so maybe it's good to say it that way. Anyway, you get my point. So, while they were on their way to go buy oil, the groom came. Those who were ready went with him and noticed specifically, went with him into the wedding feast. They didn't go to the wedding ceremony. They went into the wedding feast. Remember, the ceremony is taking place. He's got his bride. They're going into the wedding feast. And the door was shut. Okay, um, let me see what I want to say. It was shut to stay shut, according to the Greek tense that that's written in. And let's look about what do we know about the wedding feast? What do we know about the marriage? Let's go to Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. This is where we will see the wedding. Revelation 19, 7 and 8. 7 says, let's rejoice and be glad and give glory to him because the marriage of the Lamb has come. His bride has pre prepared herself. How did she prepare herself? How is the bride ready? Because the ceremony, the marriage is happening. They're, they're being married. How is it happening? It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. We are given the robe of righteousness to wear. The, the, the Lord himself puts his robe on us. Some even believe that back in that day that the custom was that the ones marrying gave gifts to the tenants that they gave them the clothing they wanted them to wear so it would be it would be regal and it would be beautiful they didn't come in in whatever tatters were theirs now whether that's all fact or among the elite i have a feeling that would have been among the elite not among the others but you get the idea here anyway how did the bride get dressed for her ceremony and be ready for her ceremony she put on the lord's robe of righteousness we literally put that robe on or the lord puts it on us at the moment of salvation that we step into that when we go into heaven where then we are in our robes of righteousness and we'll be seen in that way and our righteousness the righteous acts that we do my mom had a way of putting it and and like pam's from jail to prison my mom said you know everyone who is in heaven will have the robe of righteousness on them but if since it's saying that our righteous acts what we've done in the lord for the lord in the power of the holy spirit we're rewarded for she says some may have many skirts while others have flowing robes <laughs> okay <laughs> just get the point out of that but everyone has the robe on no one's there robeless no one is there in their own skin okay they're they're covered by the lord okay um Let's see. Let's go back. I think that's all I need. Oh, yeah, 7 and 8. I think that's all I need to say here. That's where I was going. Let me make sure. 8 9. Did I read 9? No, no. Let me read 9. It does fit. Then he said to me, Write, 
Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Okay, the bride's dressed, the wedding's taken place. Now, blessed are they who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. So the wedding feast follows. You don't have the feast before, you have the feast after. We even do that in our traditions. They get married and then they'll have a celebration meal. They don't do it in the other order. Okay, so keep that in mind. Go back to Matthew 25. And I think we are in verse 10. Yeah, so they were ready to go with him to the wedding feast. Feast is very important there. Okay, what follows the marriage of the lamb? Um, well, yeah, the marriage of the lamb, the lamb to her bride. When is the marriage ceremony? In essence, if you want to look at it at a certain point, it would be at the point of rapture. When we enter into his presence, we put on that robe of righteousness, that would be our wedding. So the wedding feast is going to follow that. So at rapture, we're, 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 we're married. Remember the Holy Spirit's like the engagement ring? He seals us until the moment that we are safely home, and then we have the real McCoy. Now we're with our bridegroom, okay? So let's go ahead and read it, and then I'll keep explaining it. Verse 11, yet later the other virgins also came. The ones that went out to buy who did not have the Holy Spirit, now they show up. Remember that door has been shut. Okay, they come. Lord, Lord, open for us. Lord, Lord, sir. It doesn't mean that they knew him in the way you and I call him Lord, that he's Lord of our lives and, and he, we've made him master of our lives and he's, we've given our lives to him. It's a, just a respectful term. Sir, Lord as you know, a master of a king, kingdom, because remember we're in a kingdom, but they're not saying Jehovah, Jesus, Lord, like we do, okay? So open it for us. But he answered them and he said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. In the sense of his approving or acknowledging them, he could not. They were not professors of his, I'm sorry, they were professors of him, but they weren't possessors. They professed outwardly. They looked like the five wives. They looked like they had it all. But when it came down to it, they did not belong to him. They didn't know him. He didn't know them. They had professed only with their mouth. They had not possessed within their heart. Those are why, or this reason why, he says, be on the alert then. You do not know the day or the hour. Don't put off getting saved. Don't put off getting right with the Lord. Don't put off knowing him intimately through the Holy Spirit. Get into that family. Get there so that you are at the, the marriage. And then when the, the feast comes, you are already there. Because as we go on, and we'll go on with our next um, parable, but when you're, you're there, who gets invited to the feast? Do you invite the bride? No. The bride, the bridegroom have put on the feast. They've invited the guests to come in. So again, keep that in mind. And remember, when, when it refers to the Son of Man, and some of ours do in verse 13, you, um, I think is it, I don't have it here. I think it's in King James. It refers to him again as the Son of Man. That's that Messianic title. So basically, this whole parable is teaching us that if you do not have the Holy Spirit within, you are not going into the kingdom. Remember, those who are believers now got raptured. Then the tribulation came. And I won't give you any room to believe the other, but because there are the other points out, even if you are one who thinks it's mid-trib, which if it is, why does he tell you go hide at that point instead of look up your redemption draws night? Just, just you know, one point. But even, when you've still got the rapture ahead of the millennium because the view of post doesn't even make any sense at all. That you go up to come down and how does anything happen? It, it just doesn't. It, it sends up confusion and God's not the author of confusion. So realizing the rapture has occurred. The rapture occurred, that's that, that marriage ceremony. Now what we're talking about, that they don't know when he will come. They don't know when he will come to judge. 
those who will go into that kingdom and those who won't. So even in the tribulation period, as they're coming to the end, remember we as believers know it's seven years. We who are in the scriptures know it's seven years. The unsaved who haven't read the scriptures and haven't heard don't know. And even if they have heard, they may be like these. Oh, okay, I hear it, but I haven't let it touch me inwardly. I, I know it, it on the outside, but I don't know it experientially. I haven't come to faith and believing it. I'll deal with that issue later. I've got enough on my plate right now. I just, I don't want to rock the boat, and I'm just going along, and, and you know, it's, it, it'll all work out, man. It all pans out. Don't you know that? I hate hearing that. They're the ones that will find themselves shocked by the Son of Man returning. They scoff today. Oh, you've been saying he'll come for, for ages. Yeah, we have. We never said when because we don't know when either. He will come for us in rapture and we will suddenly disappear. But the world's going to have an excuse for that. And they're going to go on. They're going to go on through the tribulation period and God's going to pour out judgment on them to awaken them, to make them realize you need to pay attention to the God of creation. You need to pay attention to the one who, who can bring you shalom, who can bring you through, the one who is faithful to his word. And furthermore, Israel, you need to get right with your God. Just because you're Israel doesn't make it right. It has to be individually. Don't put it off. You don't know when he's going to come back. Yes, he gave us a period of time where you can know it in approximate, approximately, but it's going to be cut short because God in his mercy is going to come back early. So be ready. Don't be caught. Okay, now keep all that in mind. Go into our second parable. Yeah, we got a little time still. Parable of the talents now. Uh, the talents are going to teach us that the, the unequal gifts if used with the same faithfulness, they're equally rewarded. So, one may have the ability to do a whole lot more for the Lord than this one over here, who wasn't given that much ability, but this one that was given less ability was just as faithful, did all that the Lord had wanted this one to do. Both will get a full reward. So, all of you who feel like, wow, you know, Okay, Billy Graham pops into my mind. Great evangelist, so many in heaven because of him. Great's going to be his reward. I hope I get a little hovel on the back street in heaven because I certainly won't have a mansion like Billy Graham. <laughs> I've heard that, okay? <laughs> well, I'm here to tell you that's not how God judges it. If you did what God called you to do, he called you to be a good worker in an office and to share the Word of God with your co-workers, to be a light and a witness, to bring up your family in the nurture of the Lord, to teach it to your children, to share it with your neighbors. He gave you just a little slice of the pie and said, be faithful to me on that street that, that another state doesn't even know the name of the street. Okay? I live on Jesse. Does Jesse Street mean anything to anybody in Arizona or in Washington or in Illinois? <laughs> I throw out Illinois for my cousins. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. But if I'm faithful here and I do what God has called me to do here and I do it to the fullness of the ability he's given me, notice I didn't say to my ability, because I got news for you, I ain't worth nothing. And I don't even say it with proper English because I'm not even worth the proper English, okay? It's not me, but the Holy Spirit within me, if I yield and humble myself to Him, allow Him to work through me and do what God has called me to do, I will have as great a mansion or whatever it is as Billy Graham, who we put up on that pedestal and say, look at him. Now, I'm not minimizing him. I... I I'm thrilled for him because I have another cousin, not these two, but I have another cousin who actually, I take that back, he was my great uncle, still a relative, who is in heaven, who in the last little bit of his life heard the gospel message from Billy Graham, accepted the Lord, and got to go to heaven. So I'm not minimizing, okay? I, I appreciate, but I want you to get that point because I hear time and time again, well, who am I? And what can I do? Well, let me ask you this question. Who was in Billy Graham that enabled Billy Graham to do what he did? Was that not the Holy Spirit? Okay. Who's in you? 
Is it not the same Holy Spirit? Did God just give you one little slice of the Holy Spirit? He just gave you the, the, the finger of the Holy Spirit, not the voice of the Holy Spirit, not the power of the Holy Spirit, not the strength. You're all saying she's mishugana, she's crazy. Of course that's not what's being said. Right. So if you allow the Holy Spirit to do in you to the fullness what God wants of you, you will see the full reward. Now with that in mind, go into the talents. And I think you'll understand the talents a whole lot better and a whole lot easier than you would without that background, okay? We need to be faithful now. Now is our opportunity. During the tribulation, those who are here then, who have come to faith, they got saved after the rapture, they need to be in faithful service then. It's going to be harder then. It's hard now, but it's going to be harder then. There's going to be far more martyrdom then than there is now. We see some, we know some, third world countries, it's a, a high level there. But here in our little corner of the world, we're pretty cushy people, and yet we still need to be faithful. Okay, so... For it, what's the it? The same thing in verse 1, the kingdom of heaven. It's just like a man about to go on a journey, okay? Remember the son of man was the one spoken about. This is the son of man again. He's going to, and verse 13 tells us that because we're following through, only that's from the King James. If you don't have the King James, you don't have it, but just take it and understand it because we have it all the way from the start of this chapter, that it, we're talking about the Son of Man coming. So, it's just like a man who goes on a journey, okay? He's going to a far country, your scripture might even say. He's going abroad. What do I see in that? I see Yeshua return to heaven. He's not walking on this earth the same way he did with his Talmudim. I think that the high point was the day they saw him in resurrection. And one of the hardest, lowest points had to be when they watched him ascend into heaven and feel that emptiness of him being left behind until the Holy Spirit came and indwelt them and brought it to them in that intimate way again. I think there had been great emptiness. I think those are hard days. I'm glad I didn't live through that. Anyway, the Son of Man's gone on a journey. He's gone back to heaven. He called his own slaves. Remember, he called the nation of Israel. They were his servant nation, his slave nation. He entrusted his possessions to them. What did he entrust to them? The gospel, the message of the gospel of the kingdom, the message of that the Lord will come again, the message of who the Lord is. They were to take that. They were to care for it. They were to manage it. They were to handle the word of God and to share it with the nation. Remember right after Yeshua resurrected, and, and goes into heaven, there's still a time period when the kingdom is still being offered to the nation of Israel. If they would recognize their Messiah, if they would accept him as Messiah, then he would have come and set up his kingdom. He knew they would not. He had a, a not an ulterior plan and not a plan B. He had a plan knowing this was what was going to happen. And he did it because he planned all along to bring the Gentiles in. He had planned all along not to leave them out until the point of the shed blood in heaven for all. They had to come in as proselytes to Judaism. They had to come in and keep the sacrificial system to show their faith. After, when we get into what we call the church age, in the book of Acts, the transition into what all Paul brings to us, now they don't have to do the sacrificial system anymore. The shed blood has been placed there. They're, they're told that. It's preached at them. The book of Hebrews deals with this. The Hebrew Christians were looked at as another sect. You had your Pharisees. They believed in an afterlife, so they were fair, I see. You had your Sadducees. They didn't even believe in an afterlife and any of that, so they were sad, you see. That will help you remember those two groups. There were other people, and they took in the Hebrew Christians in Judaism as another branch. Today, it's really still true. You have Orthodox, Conservative, Reformed, and you have another branch called Messianic. We're the ones who are the Hebrew Christians. The book called Hebrews in your Bible, the book called to the Messianic congregation, deals with this also. The, at first, they were allowed into the temple, just like always. They went and prayed at the times they were to pray. When you hear that Peter healed the man that... that um, 
He couldn't walk. He was at the gate, and he wanted silver or gold. He wanted money. And Peter said, I don't have any of that, but what I have I'll give you in the name of Yeshua Jesus. Rise up and walk. And he heals him. He was going to the temple for prayer at that time. He was going to the temple at the third hour, I think it is, or the ninth hour, whichever time it was, because they go to the temple to pray both those times. They were keeping the traditions, but they were no longer keeping the sacrifices. The 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 trying to talk to you about the sacrificial lamb of God, the perfect lamb, the perfect blood had now been shed. So they were not doing the sacrificial system. The word gets out that Paul's teaching they don't have to, they don't have to keep all the commandments of Moses. And there's a great controversy. We have the council in Acts 15. What are we going to do with these that are coming in that are Gentiles who are coming into faith? Do they have to be circumcised? Do they have to do this? Do they have to do that? What do we do about these who are saying, we don't have to do the sacrifices anymore? You know, well, Paul dealt, well, now you know who I think wrote Hebrews. <laughs> you get that one for free too. The author of Hebrews deals with it extensively and tells them there is a better sacrifice. There is a better priesthood that every Everything about Hebrews that you read in Hebrews is all better. It's a better, better, better. This all was building and looking, and now you've got the better. Judaism is a bud, Christianity is a flower that comes out of it. It's not called Christianity yet, but it is the roots of our Christianity. Now there's a new way to go. And now they don't need to keep those sacrifices. And furthermore, God's stamp of approval to prove it, I believe, is another reason, not the only because it was judgment, but why he allowed the temple to be burned in 70 AD. The only place you can do the sacrifices is at the temple in Jerusalem, not any other place in this entire world. It had to be there, and God let it be destroyed. So if they were still dependent on the sacrificial system, then I would have to say to you that every Jew is condemned from 70 AD all the way to 2021 because we still don't have a temple that we can make sacrifices in. But obviously, that's not what God was doing. God had changed it, and now they were, the, the, the Gentiles were able to come in on that equal footing, which we see in uh, Shavuot. We see it, uh, yeah, Shavuot. We see it um, right after, 50 days after, um, okay, 40 days after he resurrected, 50 days after Passover. Pesach goes to, to Shavuot. Shavuot showed us the two wave loaves that are brought to the Lord, Gentile and Jew, both with leaven, because we both are on the same footing. We're both sinners. We come to God the same way. How do we come to God the Father now? In Judaism, no. Now we come to God the Father through the shed blood of the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. So now there's a new way. Now there's a new process. Now this is the way that they are to go. But... Uh, up until this point, and in this, this parable, you don't have that new way. You don't have Yeshua's death yet. You don't have the change that has opened what we call the church age, where you come into faith in the Jewish Messiah, but where you don't come into it through keeping the commandments uh, religiously, ritualistically. Okay, so we're before all that. We're under the time that they had to come in through Judaism. They had to come in through keeping all of that that was going on. And so the Jewish people were the, um, the mouthpiece, the emissary to the world. You had to come through them to be right with God, okay, through their practices, what was laid down for them in, in the law, okay? So... The Jews were given the gospel, the kingdom, the message that the Messiah would come, the message that he would come and judge, all this. They were to be his representative to the world. They would bring salvation to the world. They would bring how they could be right so they could enter into his kingdom. Okay, so that's what it's meaning when it says that all his, he entrusted all his possessions to them. He entrusted his word to them to take to the world. To one, he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his own ability. Okay, can I build a skyscraper? No, God didn't give me that ability. He gave everyone different abilities and they were to, to act according to the ability God gave them. So he gave out different amounts according to um, the ability and uh, <clears throat> Oh, 
Oh, okay, okay. If you have talent here still, talent was a high value. Verse 18 tells us um, that it was money that was being exchanged, so it would be like a talent of silver. At that time, a talent of silver would have been, uh, or maybe I'm not sure what time, but I'm told it was worth $1,000 or 240 pounds if you were going by weight. So this was a large, talent was a good, you got a talent, you got a lot. It wasn't just that you got a little raindrop. <laughs> you got a lot, he gave a lot. And if you had ability to handle a lot more, he gave you a lot more, okay? We see in people, go to a classroom, you see a classroom, you will see born leaders, and you will see born followers, and you will see the majority of the group in the middle that don't know which way to go, <laughs> okay? The ones that had more ability, he gave more to. The ones who had less, he gave less to, but the capacity for more was what you did with your ability. The same way when I've taught a child and said, when you show me responsibility with that, I'll give you more responsibility. But if you show me the opposite, I'll pull back what I've given you. Keep these kind of thoughts in mind as we go on. So, they were given these different talents, and he went off on his journey. Verse 16, I think I've told you everything. Yeah, verse 16, 16 and 17, we're going to see the first two, the, that he gave five and two, the ten two, what was it, or two? Five, two, and one. Okay, so in this one, there's two parables that are similar. The one he gave five, two, and the one he gave two, two, they're, they're both going to be seen diligent, faithful, and they're going to double their capital. They're going to, they, they did it 100%, and they're going to get 100% gain on the return, okay? The one who had received, verse 16, five talents, immediately went, did business with him, and he earned five more talents. He doubled his, his what his, he had, his profit here. In the same way, the one who had received the two talents earned two more. But, here's your different one. The one who received the one talent went away, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. He displayed no diligence. He didn't do any attempting. He didn't try. He wasn't challenged by his opportunity. Remember the Jewish people in the tribulation are going to be challenged in the circumstances, and those who are going to help them will be challenged. It's not going to be easy to help one who has not given allegiance to the Antichrist because you're putting your own neck on the line too, you know, and you're sharing the little that you have because you had to, to scrounge to get what you got. So it's not going to be easy, but if they show their ability, they're going to be blessed for it. Mm -hmm. So when he dug the hole, it was just a common place. He just hid it in the earth, just didn't even try to do anything with even it Even if he'd have lost it, at least he'd have tried. <laughs> Patty's saying even if he'd lost it, at least he would have tried. Right. You know, not fun. That, that example isn't given to his kids. You can't lose it. But it, it uh, but yes, it would have shown. It, because, we're, again, we're in a parable. It would have shown something. But he showed 100% total lack. So what happens? Verse 19. It's been a long time. The master of the slaves has come, the master of Israel. He has returned. He's come, and he's going to settle accounts with them. The one who received the five talents came up to him and brought five more. He showed that he had gained. He gained by doing business honestly. He was faithful. It shows his faithfulness uh, indicated here. Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I've earned five more talents. And his master says, well done, good and faithful servant or slave. You were faithful in a few things. You were faithful with five. Um, I'll put you in charge of many things. So the, he showed himself faithful. He, going into the kingdom, he's going to rule with the Lord in, in his reward. He might be given to be over a whole state or a whole country. He's going to have a huge responsibility because he's shown himself faithful in all that he was given. Long comes the one with two. The one who'd received two, verse 22, came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I've earned two more. Again, 100% gain. He did fully what could be done with the two he was given. He gets the same sentence. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. So he too is going to get a whole area to be ruling over or whatever, however the rewards are for the <coughs> kingdom. Enter into the joy of your master. 
you're entering into joyfulness and fullness and, and feeling that completeness and the satisfaction, you know how you feel when you've done something right and the Lord smiles on you. You know how that feels now. That's what we're seeing here. Okay? Their faithfulness was equal. Their reward was, was also the same for the faithfulness. And along comes our one who buried the one. Verse 24. Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. I was afraid, so I went away and I hid your town in the ground. See, you still have what's yours. Here, I, I've got it to give back to you. Okay, he says that he knew him. Okay, um, he knew him to be a hard man. He's saying that, that by experience, I know. I, the way you've dealt with me, I know you're a hard man. You're harsh, you're cruel, you're stern, you're merciless, you're rough. And you're profiting from the labors of others. You just, you're getting others to do your work and then you're taking the booty. Now, that's how he's describing the Lord. Is any of that right? No. This was not a weak believer. This was not a rebellious backslider. This is one who didn't know him. Didn't know him at all. Okay? His master answers him and says to him, You worthless, lazy slave. Did you know that I reap where I don't sow? And he's not agreeing with him. He's saying, Oh, yeah? Is that what I do? I reap where I don't sow? I gather where I didn't scatter the seed? Well, even if that were true, because obviously from the way it's phrased, it's not, then you ought to have put money in that bank. Instead of losing it, you know, you ought to at least put money in the bank, and on my arrival, I would have received my money back in interest. You should have at least done that. Therefore, take away the talent from him, give it to the one who has ten, the one who had already had his doubled. Um, remember, he, he tried to say, well, I was afraid of you. He's giving him no room for that. He's saying, you know, if, if you were afraid, you could have at least put it in the bank. You could have at least drawn interest. You could have at least shown, you know, some initiative. But you are the one who is evil. You are the one who is lazy. You didn't know me. Um, and have we read verse 27? We have. You, oh, it was necessary then that you should have given it to the bankers. I already said that. The, the gathering of the interest is even interesting for the Jewish nation. They could not charge interest to their fellow brethren. They could to the Gentile nations, but to their brethren, if they had to loan to their brethren, it had to be an equal cross. You didn't take anything more from your brethren. It showed a kindness and a fairness that was there. He didn't even have that. Yes, Pat. Can you look at uh, where it talks about the talent? Can you look at that as faith? Like all the others shared their faith, and the one guy that buried it kept his faith to himself. Can you no. look at it kind of like No, that because thing? then he, right, Patty just said he if didn't he had even faith, have he faith. He said he was an he unjust. Right, he didn't even have faith. If he oh, had faith, faith, you can't lose your salvation. You can't oh. lose your faith. If you have faith, you have it. So, no, it would fall down there because, oh, yeah, he didn't. Did you say that if he, if he had faith, he would have known Sure, he would, and, and he would not have said you were unjust. Exactly, you... exactly. You're unfair, and you're yeah. you're oh. you're he gaining by him. others. No, he didn't oh, know him. Okay. He didn't know. Him. This is not even the professors. This is worse than the professors because they they at least went along, and you know the 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 Laodicean church, you know, thinks that it's doing right, you know. But it, well, I can't even say that because they're just as bad. Um, so what Laodicean would you is not talent. Saved. The talent was the ability God gave them to do. His ability, he didn't even he didn't take he didn't even take what God had given him. It, he God gives everyone a measure to faith to believe. Okay, everyone's born with that tug at the heart, that place of position, that spark. I will say where if they respond to it, then He gives them more light and more light and more light to bring them to salvation. He didn't even respond to what was given to him. He just, he just, he just, he just he did buried it. Away. Yeah, hid it away. He didn't respond. He didn't come out in faith. He wasn't a scaredy cat believer. He just plain never came to faith. Never believed. Never, never accepted. Okay. Never came to faith. So yeah, but God gives to everyone the ability to come in faith. 
Okay. So he just never, that would be the answer for talent. He just never came to faith. Yeah, he, he never had faith. He never, he never rose to what was given to him. Oh, just okay. trying to figure out a way to put it on paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, remember, we're talking in, in the sense of reward here, too. So when we keep it in the realm of reward, the one who rightly uses what's committed to him gains reward. Um, well, verse 29, have we done it? We have it. Let's look at verse 29 see if that helps you. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. Again, we cannot talk about salvation because your salvation, anyone who has salvation has it forever. So it's not that salvation is taken away, but that he was given an ability and a chance to have faith and a chance to, to show it by his actions and be rewarded <coughs> for it. Well, he didn't even rise up and accept salvation and then do for it. He just, he... He has all the privileges removed. The opportunity to come to know the Lord, the opportunity to go into his kingdom is now taken from him. It's, it's gone. It's, it's too late. Eternal punishment will also be on the basis of works. So where he, and I'll get you in just a second, Anne, where he didn't even come to saving faith and then do with what ability God gave him. You know, everyone has talent. The saved and the unsaved alike have talents. We see that in the world. But if they don't give their talent to the Lord, if they don't come into saving faith with that talent, use that for the Lord, then they're stripped of everything because when they stand before the Lord, they stand there and they are judged then according to their works. And they're judged for the, the, say, the amount of punishment they'll receive, not for how much of heaven they get. So, see the difference? Yeah. So, so this, if you were a good singer and you didn't get up and sing... You weren't using your talents for the Lord, so you're going to be punished for that. Well, that would be if this were talking about you, and that would be a loss of reward for you. But this or is talking reward. about a different time. This is talking about for those who are going to go into the kingdom. This is not the Bema Seat of Christ. Don't confuse that as believers. When we are standing before the Lord for judgment, it's not here on earth at this earthly throne, and it most certainly is not at the great white throne where only the unsaved. We stand before the Lord for the loss of reward or the gain of reward in heaven. <coughs> now, if you're already in heaven, obviously your salvation's not up for grabs because nobody gets into heaven and says, I'm saved, and then the Lord comes along and says, no, you're not, okay? In fact, we didn't finish that. When we get to the wedding feast, and I guess we do that when I go more into the millennium, we're going to see that when Israel rejected, and we won't get to it today, so I'm going to tell you this for free, and I'll give it to you at cost next week. Um, when, when they've gone in, uh, okay, Israel rejected and so God says, okay, go to the byways, go to the Gentiles, invite them, tell anyone who wants to come, okay? So they come and they fill up the hall where the feast is going to take place. And then the master comes and he looks around and he sees one who's not in the wedding garment. He's not in that robe of righteousness. And so the Lord calls him out and says, what are you doing here? And people misunderstand it because Matthew puts the word friend in there. Um, and again, we'll get all this in detail. But every time Matthew uses friend, he uses it three times. It's not the way you and I are saying, oh, you're my friend. It's distancing himself from that person. It's, it's just respectfully saying to that, you know, calling that person brother out. Brother than brother. Um, yeah, it's not brother. It's just friend. It's someone that I gave you an opportunity to be my friend. I gave you an opportunity to be my brother, but you're not. You that are not in the robe for the wedding feast, you're cast out because you weren't one with me, okay? But for those of us who are saved, who have gone up into heaven before this marriage feast, we've stood at the bema seat of Christ. That's what it's called. That's for reward and loss of reward. That's for the crowns. That's for how flowing our robe is. That is all 
Um, we're rewarded for our faithful actions, our righteous acts that we did in the Spirit. So someone may have put on a great show and you thought they were the most godly person and they did so much for the Lord and it looked so good and they had all the glitz out there and it caught all of this attention and and they stand before the Lord because they did it thinking they were really something and it was all in their power and it wasn't being done by the Lord and they're going to... Oh, yeah. uh, my skirt's a little short. <laughs> but the it's one that was... A lot of movie stars. <laughs> but the one who humbly said, Lord God, I thank you. I'm a sinner saved by grace. By your spirit in me, Lord, use me. Let me talk to my neighbor. Give me... I'm scared, Lord. Give me the ability to talk to that neighbor. Help me conquer my fear. And they did something that the whole world's going to say, who were you? Where did you live? What did you do? <laughs> and the Lord saw that humble heart that totally relied on the Spirit and did what they were tugged at to do. And they're going to have this grand reward. They're going to have more crowns than, than somebody else. I don't know. I don't know how it is. More jewels in the crown. I don't know. But God rewards for what we do by His Spirit in our humbleness yielded before making ourselves available to him. So that's where our judgment comes. And those rewards are for us, though we get to freely give them back to the Lord. Because when someone does something really great for you, what do you want to do? Thank you. Let me give you this. Let me do this for you. Let me shower you with something. Watch the news. And when somebody saves someone else's life, they just had a, a child that was saved here recently. Everybody is so thrilled because, you know, this one was saved. And what does the mother of that child want to do in tears? Express her thankfulness. Shower this person who saved her child with everything she can think of to, to thank them. That's how we're going to feel. When we see what the Lord did for us, the real cost of what he did, when we really realize he gave his life. He left this heavenly abode, the glories of which we can't even imagine. And some of us have pretty good imaginations. <laughs> but everything we're imagining, it's, it, it doesn't even hold a candle to the glory of heaven. And when we realize he was willing to leave that, this God who created the world was willing to confine himself in a human broken down body that was going to suffer. It was going to get cold. It was going to get tired. It was going to feel hurt and rejection. It was going to know the suffering pangs of a crucifying death. Wow. When you realize that's what your God has done for you, that's what the Lord did, he saved you when you didn't do anything to earn it, anything worth it. There was nothing you could you could hold up and say, well, at least I did this, or at least I was that. You see yourself for what you are, and you realize, oh, we're just going to fall on our faces, bow down before him, praise him, and thank him. And then if we had been given something that he rewarded us with, oh, what joy to say, Lord, this is all I have here. But it's yours. Let me give it back to you. You're the one who should wear the crowns. You're worthy of the crowns. You're worthy of the jewels. You should be the one to be decked out and, and, and the spectacle for all this justice. Wow. And I'll leave it there for your imaginations to take it further. Because all I've done is scratch the surface. If I've even done that. Let your mind go. Be in the presence of the Lord. Bask in it at this moment. The glory of the Lord. The glory is so great. The Shekhinah glory that filled a whole temple. The glory that, that presented itself <coughs> in a cloud of protection over the people. That guided them. That kept them from the desert burning them or freezing them. All of this. Oh my goodness. It's so gloriful. That when Moshe wanted to see it, God said, you can't. It'll burn your eyeballs out. But I'll let you see just what remains behind. What's left over after I've passed by. And even that, his whole face shone. 
and the glory of the Lord was on him in a way that he had to veil himself. We don't get a clue. When we talk about the light of the world, the lamp and the light, we don't have a clue. The glories, that the, the glorious God and Savior we have. And who are we then to, to this one so magnanimous? And then I think the audacity of those of us who want to tell him how to do it. And those of us who want to say to him, well, I don't like your role. I shouldn't have to come through to shed blood. I'm a good person. I've done good deeds. Oh, yeah? Compared to him, your good is filthy like rags, Isaiah <coughs> says. Like that. mm -hmm. That's how he puts it. Your best is like filthy rags. And, you know, I think of a precious little one that brings a gift to daddy or mommy, you know, and, and thinks they're bringing this this beautiful, you know, the picture they drew or whatever they did, you know, and in their eyes, it is glorious, you know, and the Lord understands that heart. He lovingly, you know, takes it, puts it on his refrigerator, okay, God's got a refrigerator. <laughs> you get my idea. He loves us so much that he sees us as that little pitiful child, but he sees that heart. But now what about that heart that's saying, my way. My way. Well, we see one that was in his presence say, I'm the one they ought to worship. I'm worthy. Hey, look at me. Okay, I'm going to pick on my two little precious kitties. And you all know I adore them. I have Max and I have Minnie. And Max just thrives on attention. Oh, you can just love him and adore him all day long and he just eats it up. And then his little sister Minnie comes along, and she wants a little bit of love and attention too. She's satisfied with a little less, but I turn to her. Now, I've given Max an hour, and I turn to her to give her a minute. And Max won't take away her minute. He lets her have that minute, but you look back at him, and he's there looking so pitiful. Like, well, don't forget me. I'm here too. <laughs> My Do cat you, will let me love it. It's a pharaoh, and it's just I can pet her only when she's eating. Okay, Our so brusher, Pam has it. a love for a kitty that won't even let her express that love. Now, take that to the one who created you. And I'm taking it beyond you. I'm taking it to his creation as every single human being. And now he's got some human beings that love and love him and adore him and he's got some that are a little more in the middle but what about that creation of his that won't even let him love them won't accept his gift of love his son won't allow that into their lives no i don't need that i'm good i'm good on my own i don't need that look god and they're worse than that three-year-old that thinks they've drawn a great picture. They've got nothing to offer a holy God. They've got nothing to dress themselves up with. They've got nothing to put on. They've got nothing to give. In our human estimation, we see good in people that are not believers. But in God's holy standard, he said, if you're not on this standard with me, it's, it's worthless. And none of us can get there. None of us. The person who, who tries the hardest and lives the best cannot get there. But God in that great love said, I'll make the way for you. I'll give it all to you. I will do everything. All you have to do is receive it. That's it. Just receive it. That is such a precious gift. And yet some will toss that aside. Adrian Rogers used to tell a story. I hope I can remember it all. He didn't know I was going to do it. I would have tried to go look it up. But he told the story of a man that was a doctor. He was called from far away to a patient that was dying that needed a, a, a remedy that he had come up with himself. He had the only thing that was going to save this person. This person was on his deathbed. 
So the man is, is hurrying to get to the side of this sick patient, traveling a distance. He'd taken his son with him. There was a horrible car crash, and his son died in that accident. Because of the way the car crash was, he was even covered in his son's blood. And heartbroken, yet knowing, I've got to get this medicine to this person before they die. He pushed on. Didn't stop, didn't clean himself up, just pushed on. He got to the side of that dying person who desperately needs what he had to give, what he had created. And that dying person took that vial, looked at it, did not like the looks of it, threw it on the ground, broke it, and said, now heal me. Oh gosh. Do you see what's happened? Every unsaved person who comes to the Lord and says, I'm good enough, or do it my way, has thrown on the ground that precious remedy, the shed blood of the Son all over the Father for nothing, because it was for nothing for that one who wouldn't receive. He's my favorite. Adrian, Adrian Rogers, he's my favorite. Too bad he passed away, though. Well, wonderful for him. Yeah. Wonderful but for him. But we still get to hear him. Yes, on yes. Television. But don't miss the point. He's very good. God, right? in his love, created the most beautiful and perfect way for every individual to be saved. The talents are not talking about, i got to earn it, I've got to work it up. No, that's your reward. That's loss of reward for these is what they're, they're going. The one who didn't even enter in is the one who won't go into the kingdom. The one who is in the kingdom, how what they get to do in that kingdom. We also will have rewards for what we've done. I've already talked about that, but don't miss this. Because here's where I want to leave it for today, because we're out of time, and I'm sorry, but... Time goes too fast. We'll pick it up at the very end of this. We'll talk about how they're clothed and, again, tie it into the Jewish nation and see what we're talking about. But I just feel in my spirit the urgency to tell you, make sure you're not trusting in yourself. Make sure you're not trusting in your good deeds. Make sure that you have not put on a facade that you're not the virgin with the lamp, but there's no oil in it. Make sure that you know that you know that you know that you are trusting in the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, that you cannot argue against the God who created. And why would you want to when he came up with a perfect plan that you don't have to do? He did it all for you. But make sure you come into that. Make sure you are his child. Then if you are his child, just simply humble yourself before him and allow him to work through you. And it will be a work of beauty because God doesn't do anything less than beautiful. And if you have that most precious gift, if it's yours and you know it, then here is what I'm telling every single person. Share it. Share it. Don't keep it to yourself. If you are so looking forward to the glories of heaven and what's going to be yours, share it with your neighbor. Share it with your friend. Share it with the gas attendant. Share it with the grocery store worker. Share it with the restaurant worker. Give it in the form of a tract that spells it out and say, Thank you. I want to give you something. This is the best thing in my life. I want you to know about it too. If you really have it, spread it. Spread it. Because time is short. And they're going to miss one or the other. The first call, the rapture, and they're going to find themselves in the tribulation. And then if they turn and keep hardening their hearts through that, they will miss what comes after that. There'll be those that will go into the fire, those who will suffer forever. If you can catch how glorious, you can catch how horrible, and anyone within your earshot <coughs> is worth hearing how to get the glory. So, beloved, we took a turn I didn't see. I trust it's speaking to your heart today. 
I'm going to close in prayer because I know this goes out beyond this Zoom class and it will go into the internet where it will be heard again and again. I'm going to close in a word of prayer. I'm going to give opportunity for anyone who does not know the Lord in the way I've described to open their heart because I'm not going to take any chance. I can't judge. I can't see your heart. You can look great to me. You can look great to the world. You can fool the whole world, but you can't fool God. And he's the only one that matters because he's got the final say. And if you're one with, I'll be praying for you also that we get up and go. Share it, go. Because that is the most important thing that we can do. And oh, by the way, you're going to get a reward if you do it. <laughs> Isn't that just like our great God? <coughs> Let's close in prayer. Adonai Yeshua, Lord Jesus, oh, you open up our hearts to capacity of love that it is beyond humanness and beyond understanding the love that you showed us in leaving heaven and coming down to this earth, being one like us that you could rescue us because it, it took a perfect man to rescue man and only you have ever lived perfectly. Lord, how thankful we are to know this story of love, to know this true story, to know that you shed your blood that we might live. Lord, I pray anyone hearing this, that if they are feeling that tug at their heart, if they're arguing with these words, Lord, let them just simply give up the fight, humble themselves before you. Let them, if they're feeling it and wanting it, come, because you say your arms are always open, and you say, come, come, let all who are thirsty come. Lord, let them open their heart right now, and not by magic words, but in something like this, let them say, I believe in you, Jesus, as my Savior. I want your blood in my place. I want to be right before you and be able to be in your eternal heaven one day. Thank you. You have saved me. Thank you that I now belong to you in a new way. Help me learn how to serve you. Amen. And Lord, for all of us who do have you in our heart, who love you a little bit more now than we did five minutes ago because you open up that capacity and you enable us, Lord, light that fire under us. Don't let us stay silent. Let us get out and share it with our family, our friends, our neighbors, whoever it be, Lord. Send us far and send us near. Open our eyes to see the way you see the world, one in need of you or one who belongs to you. And let us share that they might be, if they are one who needs, they might become one who has. Thank you. You freely gave it. Thank you that you give it to any and all who will come, that you died for the entire world. Lord, thank you. Your word is true. Your promises are true. There will be a millennial kingdom. There is a time coming when you will call the believers home to be with you. There is an eternity to face. And Lord, thank you. We have no fear, those of us who are in you, of ever being in an eternal state of suffering. For us, the glories we can't even compare to anything on this earth. Thank you for being such a loving, generous, giving, caring God. Thank you that you didn't just create us and leave us on our own. You created us and you loved us and you made the way home. We praise you forever and ever. Lord, we join the heavenly choir. I see the 24 elders falling on their face and worshiping you. I see the four living creatures crying out, glory, 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 holy, 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 kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. I hear those who've gone on before us. I hear my folks' voice in the choir. I hear Pastor Frederick in that group. I hear Avraham and Yitzhak and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Lord, I hear those in my hearing, like faith, like mine, and like me, all now saying, Hallelujah! <coughs> Glory be unto you. We praise you forever and ever. In Jesus' holy, precious, healing name we pray, our Messiah, our Savior. Amen. Amen. <sighs> what a way to end. Hallelujah. Let me hear it. Anybody there? Any hallelujahs? Hallelujah.